welcome everyone to another episode of Optimal Health for Busy Entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Julian Hayes, second back at it again. And I'm here with another fellow awesome individual, fascinating human who is the embodiment of what this podcast, what this branding, and what I think live means to live a good life. And that is just to constantly keep growing and leading yourself. And we're here to talk about a very important topic that I have not really addressed in its focus. I know it sounds so basic, but if you think about it, if we do not have optimal focus, optimal attention management, then we're probably going to make poorer food decisions. We're probably going to operate out of our feelings instead of our logic, which is good to have feelings and everything. It's happened to our emotions. But when it comes to that run, especially if you are in the South right now, like I am, and it is 90 something degrees, which I forgot Celsius, 30 something Celsius, I think. Don't quote me on that. Plus humidity, you might not do it because you don't feel like it. And this is why it's focused and good to have the vision and all that good stuff. So I am here with Katie Studart. She is a award-winning international coach in the area of transformative self-leadership for business owners, um, execs, and founders. And she is also the host of the Focus B Show. So without further ado, Katie, how's it going today? Yeah, thank you, Judy. And I loved your introduction. <laughs> I was picturing <laughs> you in the heat and I'm thinking, yeah, that does make it harder to focus. It's true. <laughs> Any yeah. challenge can make it harder to focus. <laughs> Well, I appreciate it. I, you know, it's just, I was trying to freestyle. This is the closest I can ever get to being like a rapper or anything like that. So um, this is the time for me to try to do like an open monologue or a freestyle just off the top of my head. So I'm glad it was well received. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I love music too, but it's true. I never think about my podcast as singing, but yeah, it's true. It could be like a, like close to rapping sometimes. Yeah, I guess. rapping, music. I was never really a rapper and we're, I'll not go too far down this rabbit hole, but I was more of a crooner. I always wanted to be like the 1940s, 50s singer, just with the, just with an open mic, very minimalistic background, and then just really shining the vocals. But this voice is not conducive for that. So podcasting is the next best thing, right? Yeah, agreed. <laughs> so the first thing before we even dive into your backstory is I got to know, how was it interviewing your 99 year old grandmother? Ah, uh, yes, that's one of the latest episodes I released, good point. And it was amazing. I'd been wanting to do it for about a year when the when it first crossed my mind. I thought, oh, I have to have my grandmother on the show. She's 99. I was like, oh, she still lives. Uh, because obviously it was hard to, to travel, so I couldn't see her. And then over Easter, we, we all gathered together. And so I asked her, can I interview you on my podcast? And she said, yes. And it was wonderful. First of all, I realized she was a very good speaker. She didn't use any uhs and ahs. She was very articulate. I was like, wow, I never really paid that close attention. And also, it was really beautiful what she shared about looking at the bright side of life. That was one of her key messages was, you know, things can be tough, but you focus on what you can change and you do something about it or you accept what you can't change, which is the whole, you know, dichotomy of control of the Stoics. But she didn't say this is the Stoic dichotomy of control. She just said, look on the bright side of life. And I really feel that's her philosophy. And sometimes when we go walking together, she'll stop and she'll point at the flowers and the birds. And I'm like, gee, she's 99 and she's still interested in that flower. <laughs> yeah. And so like she doesn't get bored of these small things and this is something I've always really admired in her so that was one of the key reasons and also she led quite a healthy life in some ways in terms of eating fruit and veg in the garden walking every day um, and not doing too many things in excess so I so thought if I can share that message with the world um, yeah that's what inspired me to interview her but it was a lovely moment. Wow that's a that's an awesome thing see I didn't even think about interviewing like my grandmother or even my mother on a podcast, but I think I might do that in the future. I was thinking about this in the form of, I need to document some of like my grandmother and mother and various family members for the next generation. Because a lot of times we say, Hey, this is your grandma. This is, this is my grandmother, or this is your, this will be your great aunt, et cetera, et cetera. You see a picture of them, but what would it be like to really get to hear these people talk and interact with you? and pass it down to generations and that's a way that they can live forever so um but i that's like true. this i like this idea i'm gonna i'm gonna take it i'll give you credit though 
<laughs> you don't even have to but I don't even know how I had the idea it's just at one point it was it was one of those things I just had the idea and once I had it I was like I have to do it mm-hmm. and you know her, her hundreds is normally in September and you know hopefully she makes it till then and uh, then uh, I you know I'll yeah I'll interview her again and then I can be like I interviewed my hundreds great you know yeah. your grandmother <laughs> so at least I interviewed her once which was lovely so and also one last thing on that po- topic she said she'd never been officially interviewed that way. And then I thought, wow, you know, so many people that have so many things to say and so much wisdom and insight. And we're doing podcast interviews all the time. Like we're super special, right? But there's all these folks out there that are amazing and who never get a voice. And so I thought that's something else to think about when we have podcasts is who do we want to give this you know voice to? There's so many people who never get to express uh, the wisdom they have. And we each and every person has at least one thing to share if not a gazillion things to to share so that was also insightful yeah i think in the world of the podcasting that at times it's easy to fall into this bubble because we pretty much exist online a lot of our stuff is online right and we forget that there's a whole other world out there that barely uses the internet in this way that we use it but has so much wisdom. And I know for me over the course of the last few months, I've been spending less time online and more time offline. And just my my view of the world is a lot more positive now. And my mental health, most importantly, is better. When I'm, I'm, I'm a lot more intentional with getting online instead of just browsing and browsing, but getting on here with some intentionality and then getting off and getting back into the quote unquote real world and interacting with the actual people. Because there's something about talking face to face right now, uh, like we're doing over Zoom, but face to face across the table, you can feel a lot of different things that you can't feel through this digital screen. Absolutely, 200%. I think that spending the most time as possible offline is also one of my goals. I've also been cutting down on on hours online. Also, you become more efficient. I was staying with a friend in Nyon. It was only for, you know, three, four days. I hadn't seen her in years. So suddenly I was just working till 3 p.m., managing to cram a lot in, be super focused and then leave so that we could go hiking. So we could, I went to her kickboxing class, we went to the cinema and I felt like I had a second life. I felt that the time after work from 3 p.m. to sort of 11 p.m. was a whole day and I'd had sort of a whole day-ish of work. And I thought, wow, why don't I do this more often? Why do I default to finishing between five and seven? The odd day you can finish at three, you cram everything in and then you, you know, do real stuff <laughs> outside of the screen. You know, that's a very good point. And I mean, I'm going to fail at that today because I'm not going to finish the probably five or seven. <laughs> but um, it does make sense, though, like, wh- why? And I, I think it's almost goes back to, I think it's Parkinson's law. That yes. when you, if you think you have all day, then you're going to take all day with, these, with, with whatever you got going on. But if you actually Absolutely. give yourself a cutoff time, you're most likely going to find a way to take care of all these things within that allocated time. Yeah. I mean, I won't lie that I kind of had to make up for it a bit this week, right? Mm-hmm. I did sort of push a bunch of, you know, I prepped in, a, in advance a lot of content. So I didn't have to do any content that week, et cetera. So I did sort of have to catch up on things a bit, but it was remarkable how you just think more efficiently, you cut corners, you really focus on the two, three key important things, you, you know, batch all the small things. I mean, you do all the productivity stuff that we know, mm-hmm. but that sometimes when we're working from sort of 8 or 9 a.m. till 6 or 7 p.m. gets lost a bit along the way, right? So suddenly mm-hmm. when you shorten your day, you do the Parkinson law thing and think, wow, I remember one point I had this request sort of to send a proposal and I hadn't scheduled it in my day. And I'm like, Ooh, my day's already super short. I think I finished at 3.30. She's picking up at 3.30. I was like, how do I fit it in? And suddenly you just do, right? Suddenly you just do. You, you're super efficient. You think really clearly, la, la, la. And I fitted in the proposal on top of already my short day of work. So yeah, it just shows that it's possible. Of course, we can't do it all the time or, you know, we work part time otherwise. But yeah, it's amazing how if we really want to and we have a real reason to spend more time offline, like in this case, staying with a friend, mm-hmm. then suddenly we just make it happen. Yeah. And so before you got into this world that you're in now, um, your origin story, um, how did you get to where you are now? What's, what's the pre 
<laughs> it's so funny how for most people this is always the second part right it's a, mm -hmm. the, the people rarely leave uni and, and start their own business it happens but it's it's not the majority so before being an entrepreneur and coach and, and you know founder and facilitator and consultant and all of that I uh, worked at sea I was an engineer so I used to do maps of the sea floor and uh, I did that for five years and uh, that's where I met my husband I met my husband at sea uh, which sounds very romantic. It was. It does. Very I, was, I was getting ready to say that sounds very romantic. That sounds and like a was. Hall, sounds like a it Hallmark was. movie. <laughs> it was a, a great start to the relationship for sure. So, so that was one you know great thing that came out of my life at sea, and and also we got to travel a bit. And um, then I just re I sort of got into the personal development world, and I was looking to do something that was related to people you know I really like people and I like personal development philosophy and psychology and I discovered coaching and I still remember the first day I was on this sort of training workshop around coaching and I just loved it you know like when you just love something like when you hear a song you love and you just absolutely. fall in love with it absolutely or when you see a movie and you just mm -hmm. can't stop talking about it that's how I felt that literally within an hour I was just like this is amazing. <laughs> I'd always set goals, for example, but didn't know about, oh, God knows, I didn't know about anything. I set goals, but then I didn't, you know, break them down in chunks and I didn't know about smart goals. And so I'd always had like, you know, write a book before I'm 25 and da, 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 which I've managed, but <laughs> I managed to write my book actually before I was 25, not that I published it because of my grandmother. It was sort of my first year at sea and I sent it to her and I, had, I sort of put myself under time pressure and thought my grandmother won't live forever. I need to send her the document. Um, so that's how I managed that goal. And, you know, she did live a few <laughs> more years. I am older than 25 now. And so, yeah, so when I discovered coaching, it was really well, life changing. And so that was the training. And then I did the whole training and then quit my job working at sea and started my own business. <laughs> wow. So, you know, you have this established career at sea, which sounds like a very fun job, by the way. I have to, I have to admit, it sounds very fun. Um, but after, but as you go along, a lot of times with people, you get comfortable in this career because you're getting this financial security, you're getting this known thing, and then we over here on the other side, you have this unknown thing. You're essentially taking the quote unquote leap. Because there's no guarantees when you're starting your own business, when you're starting your own venture, that it's going to work out. So did you have any initial fears around that and hesitations? Yes, absolutely. And I think we all do. Um, I think people have different fears. So, you know, some people, it might be financial security. Other people might be status. I think in my case, it was a lot around identity. So I sort of had this identity of, you know, I'm the girl that works at sea. It's kind of fun. It's adventurous. People think it's cool. Therefore, I'm cool. And it was less <laughs> about a, an engineering status um, or the, the financial stability. I think uh, some people are more or less inclined to take risks in that direction. In my case, it was more like, oh, if I'm not the girl working at sea anymore, who am I? And then I had this fear that, you know, life coaching sounded flaky. And, you know, I came from a tech background that was very, you know, mathematical and blah, blah, blah. And I thought, wow, maybe, you know, people at sea will think I'm flaky. And I had all this sort of fear of what would people say, which is interesting because that wasn't something I had a lot of. You know, mm -hmm. there's some people who are always, you know, they write a document and they think, what will their colleagues say? And it's sort of a thought pattern they have a lot. And I tended not to care too, too much what people thought. But when I was about to take that leap, that was sort of my biggest fear. God, if I'm not the girl working at sea anymore, how do I introduce myself? Who am I? What will people think? Uh, fortunately, my, my family was very supportive. So my parents were very supportive. My husband was very supportive. So I wasn't too much afraid of their reaction, uh, which was great, which helped a lot. But it was more sort of all the people I knew on the boats and stuff, which was so strange to think about it now. But yeah, now, you know, I don't mind writing a whole post on meditation or I talk about the law of attraction or and I'm not scared what people will think. But I think at that time I hadn't worked so much on myself or my own personal growth. So there was still a lot of these types of obstacles. Yeah. Speaking on meditation, um, you recently did a, a, a 10 day meditation retreat right it was silent. It wasn't 10 it was only three oh, but three i am day. planning okay. on doing a 10 it was a okay. three day silent meditation retreat yeah okay how was that yeah that was uh amazing it, 
I did the three day one because I've been wanting to do a 10 day med silent meditation retreat for about, I don't know, two, three years now. And I, I'm just scared, you know, I was just scared, like 10 days, no talking. And what if, you know, I don't make it and the fear of failure, fear of failure of a meditation retreat, right? Isn't that hilarious? <laughs> uh, and I thought, I don't know. I, I was just sort of intimidated by it. And then I was at this Enneagram conference and this woman said, well, why don't you just do three? And then, you know, law of attraction, synchronicity, whatever you want to call it. A couple of days later, someone says, oh, I'm going on a three-day meditation retreat. Literally the same week uh, in the same place where I was going to be for work. Uh, and this was this guy in Berlin. I'm in Sweden. And that was in France. He happened to be going exactly there. And I thought, oh, Maybe I can fit that in too. And I'd just been thinking about it. So <clears throat> fitted it in and um, yeah, it was hard. Uh, and the no talking was hard um, more than the actual meditation. Cause I felt like after every meditation session or after the morning, I just wanted to share with people, you know, how was your experience? Did you struggle? And did you hear the birds? And da, 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 da. so I felt that it was all a very inner journey on your own, even though there were people around. And that isn't something I'm used to experiencing because when I have any form of inner journey, at one point I'll share it, right? At one point I'll tell my husband mm -hmm. or I'll share it with a friend or I'll share it on a podcast. For me, a great part of the joy of any form of transformation is the sharing aspect. So it felt strange, but it was also, yeah, I mean, it was just really magical. These types of experiences are so hard to summarize, but really helps you to get gain perspective on everything. <laughs> yeah. So as you talk about transformation and that's a lot of the work that you, that, that, that you do, where, where does that start? Because when we hear transformation, it's like something that we, we understand what that is, but like conceptually, like if we break that down, how does that look? Where do, where do most, where do you recommend most people start when it comes to like, I want to transform myself? Yes. Uh, I absolutely love the word transformation. I mean, the whole concept is always there's something that's blocked or stuck or, or you're unsatisfied with, then there's actually the transformation phase where you change that and then you build the habits around it. And then there's a sort of after phase. So if we think of you sort of, let's say the, the three-day meditation retreat was, you know, transformational, it would be beforehand, you're at a certain state, maybe a bit more stressed, maybe a bit more reactive in every day. So then that's sort of your initial phase. Then during the meditation retreat, you start to gain perspective, you feel calmer. And then after the meditation retreat, you take away that you've changed, you've transformed, and you can use it in your everyday life. For example, there were people there that were going through burnout. So before transformation would be burnout during meditation retreat, learning new ways, new methods to cope with it, calming down. And hopefully after the meditation retreat, I haven't asked them, but hopefully they're no longer in a stage of burnout or they're a little more calm and composed. Okay. And, uh, you know, so as we, so you work with a lot of entrepreneurs, founders, and execs, and those people are, to say the least, are probably a little high strung, you know, I, 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 I <laughs> yeah, can throw, those are my yeah, favorite type yeah, of people. <laughs> yeah. And I can throw myself in there and <clears throat> these people are, are capable, highly talented. And a lot of times, why do you see that they, why something like focus that we know we need and we know it's beneficial. Why do, why do people struggle with that? Well, there's lots of different reasons why people struggle with focus. Um, and also coming back to the people that are very high strung, I think one of the ways I help them with isn't just focus. I think it's also sort of self-compassion and being sort of more calm and grounded. They tend to be sort of very high speed. Um, but coming back to focus, I think Oof. the the high speed aspect that I was saying, the very sort of high strong, high speed, wanting to achieve a lot and make a lot of progress can mean that people take action too much. So this is something I see, you know, just go, 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 go. And this causes lots of things. So this causes lack of focus <laughs> because when you do too many things, you end up multitasking or you end up not taking breaks and you can't think clearly or you do too many small to-dos and you struggle with the main proactive ones and you just stay reactive. And so all of this, but also there's a lack of resting, recharging and reflection. And when, and this is a great part of focus because to be more focused is as we were saying earlier, if you work sort of shorter days or if you take a lunch break where you go for a walk, 
you're so much more effective and you're so much more focused. And there's this sort of strange inner thought pattern that most people seem to have. And I know I've had it myself. That's this sort of like, I don't have time for a break, right? I don't have time to rest. I have to work. And it's not true. Like it's, it's totally a lie. But on the moment when you're going through that sort of hectic phase, your brain gets hectic and then you can't think clearly. And the only answer that your brain has is just go, 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 go. And so a big part of what I do is telling people, no, stop, stop. So during the coaching session, stop, let's, let's discuss, you know, why are you really focusing on what's happening right now? And then, you know, help them build also all these habits, both of resting and also of reflection. Because again, if you just go, 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 go for a whole month, you might've been working on the wrong things. <laughs> so if you don't stop and reflect, how do you know? Yeah, so I'm thinking also that emotions plays a big part in this as well. Is that is that something that you found as well? Yes, yes, absolutely. Emotions is huge. What type? Uh, what, what type of emotions? Um, for Ooh, most uh, okay, well, it can be anything from uh, frustration, uh, from you know not getting the results that you want, to you know disappointment in themselves that can happen, disappointment in others when they're leaders and executives, uh, and sort of underwhelmed in some way so overwhelmed when they have too much work underwhelmed in the sense when the results aren't the way they'd want to especially all these high achievers have standards that are like <laughs> mind-blowingly high and so they often have that sort of yeah frustration disappointment and stress stress just general sort of stress and pressure and all stress is self-created and um, this is something I don't necessarily tell them word for word but I help them to see through that level of stress because you can have the most chaotic and, and busy schedule in the world and still be very calm. You can imagine, uh, you know, someone like Eckhart Tolle or a monk or something that had that same schedule, they would stay calm. They just do one thing after the next. The stress only comes from the thoughts in our mind that go something like, I don't have time for this. It's never going to work. I have too much to do. When am I going to fit this in? Da -da. Those thoughts create stress. The actual schedule, no stress. It can be packed from, you know, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., maybe a bit tired, but no stress. So, yeah, that's also a part. So you use the word self-leadership. What does, what does a good leader look like to you? What does a what leader? A good leader look like to you. Mm. Yeah, great question. Calm, composed, efficient, kind. Um, those are probably the main ones. So being calm, kind, and efficient. I'm thinking about it because this morning I had a call with my, my assistant and I would think because I don't have a huge team, I mostly work, you know, with one or two other people here and there. Mm -hmm. I think, okay, these are the opportunities for me to check in, you know, am I leading this process? Well, am I, and so I would think, okay, if I'm not being kind, that doesn't mean like too nice and stuff, but just being kind then I'm not being a good leader. So I ensure that, you know, I give feedback, but I'm kind. Then I'm also, if I don't show up prepared and I don't have something efficient going on, that's also not being a great leader because they don't understand where, where we're going. And then if I'm not calm, if I'm being stressed or if I'm being anxious, I'm putting that stress onto them. So it's calm, kind, efficient. Those are probably my top three. Then there's a bunch of other stuff, you know, being a bit of a visionary, seeing where things are going, uh, being assertive so being able to give feedback but still in a kind way uh, understanding others having a good understanding of psychology and others and team dynamics but it's true that recently uh, I was working with the CEO and we had a call blah, 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 and he was just saying you know I just want to check how you're feeling about this and if you're still motivated about this project and stuff and I thought hey that's good leadership <laughs> I thought in my head I didn't say that <laughs> but it was interesting because he's a CEO right and not yeah. all CEOs are great leaders and I thought, oh, yeah, that's nice. He changed, you know, just fitting in a call to see, you know, with the consultant, because mm -hmm. I'm a consultant for him, to see if I'm still motivated by the project, uh, because a lot of things have changed recently uh, with their schedule. I thought that was really good leadership. You know, that's an example of, you know, checking in with the motivation, checking in how people are doing. And loads of people don't take time for that. And, you know, five minute call makes all the difference. Absolutely. Absolutely. How do you... Ooh. Let's see if we could simplify this. Someone wants to better lead themselves. Where would you tell them to start? Pay attention to your thoughts. Thoughts. Yeah, thoughts, thoughts, feelings, and actions, right? They're the three main pillars uh, in the self-leadership. And so the first thing is starting to notice their thoughts. So start to notice 
what's going on inside. And this can be either through talking about it, journaling, writing it down and starting to see, oh, wait, I have this pattern where I'm always getting stressed when da la 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 la. Or I have this pattern that I keep thinking I'm not good enough. Okay. Because when you start paying attention to the thoughts, you can work on it, right? When you start realizing, oh, I feel like such a failure. Okay. How come? Let's work on this. So paying attention to thoughts, then learning to manage your emotions. So, you know, through breathing exercise, through noticing the emotions and the triggers, accepting, letting go. Um, yeah, noticing it in the body helps a lot. I know the big part of my learning to deal and lead my emotions has been around noticing in the body. And by in the body, I mean really noticing. So sometimes it's around the throat. Sometimes it's, in my case, around the ears and starting to identify like what emotion with that. Um, so emotional management and then actions, of course. So it doesn't begin with actions, but it's an important one. So if you want to self-lead yourself to have a better morning routine or to exercise more, or to eat healthily, those are all your actions. So starting to look at which habits are working, which ones aren't. And yeah, so all around thoughts, feelings and emotions and actions. And then I would also say to meditate. So do those three things. Great. But if you develop a really deep meditation practice, all the others become easier. Your mm -hmm. thoughts become calmer, your emotions become more manageable, stress diminishes, cortisol diminishes, and your actions, you become more mindful and present. So it becomes easier and you have less resistance when you're doing things and you need to less force yourself to, you know, get up earlier or to and work out in the gym and it happens more naturally so i would think you can do it the hard way and really work on your thoughts on your emotions your actions and so sort of, you know discipline yourself around it or the easier way paradoxically is you know develop a kick-ass meditation practice and the rest sort of take care of itself so i'm sure you get this with meditation that people would say i don't know how to meditate and uh, which form of meditation should I use? There's so many different types. So someone that's completely new to meditation, but they want to give it a try. How do you, what do you tell them? How do you get them to start with meditating? Yeah, sure. That happens a lot. So a lot of my clients are either new to meditation or they've tried once or twice and they haven't managed. Uh, generally what I say is the two easiest ways to begin. Number one is just find guided ones online whether it's an app or youtube to be honest at the beginning it really doesn't matter what type of meditation you do it's about building the habit and the consistency so any form of meditation will do something good right it'll help you relax at least mm -hmm. and that's you know already a good thing and so either something guided or if you want to sort of do it more on yourself not guided then just breathing to 10 and so just sort of one in two out three in or one in and out, two in and out, whichever way you prefer to 10 or actually the meditation retreat, they did to seven and back. It doesn't really matter to 10 or to seven or any other number really. <laughs> it's just sort of you count and you become aware of your breath and you become aware of it in the stomach and in the chest. And, and then you just count, you know, come back to zero and try, do it again. So it's really, and like I tell them, you know, you can just sit on a chair. You don't have to sit cross-legged on the floor uh, just sit on a chair, close your eyes, count to 10 and do that a lot of times. And you can use like the app inside timer. I love that app. And then and you can put the amount of minutes. You can put five minutes, 10 minutes, just breathe and count. That's it. Seriously, that's it. It's, uh, you know, simple, but not easy. And I imagine though, that at least with me at the very beginning, you would have just these <laughs> random thoughts that seemingly come out of nowhere. And I guess the goal then is to, let that thought pass, but don't follow that thought, right? Is yes, that how absolutely. you would go about that? Yes, that's exactly it. And I'd say that even after the silent meditation retreat, and even during the silent meditation retreat, I still had random thoughts and I still had random thoughts that I pursued. And I thought, oh, wait, what am I doing? Let me come back. And that's okay. It's just we learn to, you know, develop that meta attention, uh, the attention to attention. And as that develops, we follow the thoughts less or some days more, some days less. The, I think part of the reason why it's uh, sort of a tough habit to build is that sometimes it's not like exercising where, you know, you run five miles one week, then six, you know, then one mm -hmm. day, 10, then one day a marathon, this sort of constant progress. You do feel progress in meditation. It does go deeper, especially like, you know, if you do something like a meditation retreat. 
But some days, you know, like me this morning, actually me the last three, four days, I just feel like I'm sitting and thinking. Like I, I don't even feel it's meditation anymore, right? I even stop my timer and that's okay. We go through phases, you know, different things in different people's lives. And some days the meditations just don't feel like you're even meditating. And that's where it's hard, right? That's where it's hard to be consistent because then you feel like, wow, was I even meditating? But what I find sometimes is, that's just the way it is it's not a linear way in meditation but also sometimes if I stick through it the first 10 minutes I feel I followed all my thoughts as you Mm -hmm. said but then maybe after 15 or 20 I feel oh yeah I'm doing it less now I'm getting more grounded I'm getting more present but yeah on some days like the last few days and today I'm literally just doing it to keep the habit and you know hoping the next day will be better and that's it really yeah you know i have a mentor and he talks about he he, uh, he always tells me that i need to get more in the spiritual gym i'm i'm very good in, in the other gym but i need more time dedicated to the spiritual gym and the difference is kind of like you like what you mentioned is that i can see tangible prog- progress like with my running like oh i can run longer my times is cutting down you know i'm getting stronger in the gym but it's, it's hard to measure, oh, this meditating, you know, um, you know, let's I got like a, a brain scan with me. It's like, oh, my, my brain waves are changing and everything, right? It's more optimal. So we don't just have that hanging around the house. So it's harder to see that tangible, pro- that tangible progress when it comes to something like a meditation or any type of deep breathing. And at that time, it's like you, like you said, it's just keeping the habit, trusting the process and probably probably noticing more of the smaller intangibles of life is like like i'm thinking things but i'm not following it or like my negative thought patterns are not there or if i think something negative i don't follow it i immediately think of something positive or little things like that is that kind of like how you look at it yeah yeah that's a the a way of seeing the progress i think I mean, I really love this app. I was saying inside timer because you get to have, you know, track and have a streak Mm -hmm. of days in a row. So it's almost been a year. I started using it in August and I haven't missed a day. So for me, this has really helped me because this has felt like it's progress in terms of consistency, right? It doesn't mean that I always meditated a long time. It was anything between five minutes and 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean that I always did it the same hour. I aim for first thing in the morning, 90% of the time I do, but there's the odd 10% early fly, blah, blah, blah. And I just do it in the flight or do it while I'm waiting or whatever it is I choose, especially since I'm aiming. Well, now since the meditation retreat, I'm aiming for 45 minutes. So I'm aiming to get up a lot earlier, meditate 45 minutes. I managed quite well, except the last few days. But um, again, like I said, sometimes traveling, et cetera, I'm like, I just do it on the train. But anyway, my point being, that's one way to measure progress, to see the consistency. But I like what you said about, I think sometimes I just notice it. I don't know how to explain, but it's it's a more compound effect. So I'm definitely not noticing this morning's meditation. There's some days you do, right? There's some days mm-hmm. you have a really deep meditation in the morning. You feel grounded all day and calm. Awesome. <laughs> but I am noticing years of compounding effect, right? So uh, compared to, you know, if you contrast back to how you are before and being less reactive and more present and calmer and speaking more slowly and all these things. So, yeah, I, I guess... I guess part of the exercise is not having any expectations around results and outcomes and just doing it because you do it. Like, you know, you do, you know, you have to clean the dishes or you, you, I don't know, like uh, commute to work or it's just one of those things that you just do, like going to bed at night, like you're not just going to stay up because it's fun. Uh, And so once you just learn to develop the habit for the habit and not to, you know, show off about how long you meditate or to, feel cool about yourself because you were able to not think or not follow your thoughts for, you know, uh, half an hour now, once you just do it for the sake of doing it. Um, yeah, I think that's also true growth. And it's also actually helps with one of the main lessons around letting go, right? Because you're letting go of any expectations around the practice. I'm still working on that. <laughs> I'm still working on that. Uh, high that's achievers. A, I know it's hard. That's a very, that's a letting go. It's there's a book on that too. I, I forgot the author's name. Um, David Haskins, Hawkins, maybe something like that. There's a book called Letting Go. And I read it a long time ago. I probably need to read it again because that's that's a very critical thing there because there's a lot of times I think we want to control the uncontrollable 
and a lot of times in business, there's a lot of things that we can do. We can do a lot of the actions, but it doesn't guarantee that we're going to get the desired result that we want, but we want to control that desired result regardless. And that leads to a lot of unnecessary stress. And so I, I'm, I'm as guilty. I'm raising my hand on this, two hands on this, actually. <laughs> me too, me too. Yeah. So you mentioned also the compounding effect. And I, I think that can go across fitness. That can, that, that can go across any discipline of life. And um, I'm sure you've noticed that with your podcast, that when you first started compared to where you are now. So how has that been just um, starting, a, starting a podcast and, and continuing it? Yes, I mean, amazing. And first of all, I'm so grateful for all the people I interviewed also. But I feel it's had so many more consequences on my life than I would ever have thought. First, I just thought, hey, this is fun. I'll, you know, interview a few people and talk a bit. But, you know, some people have turned into collaborations and some into clients and networking and just you meet all these amazing people. And I also sort of didn't really have any expectations talking about expectations when I began and there were so many amazing things that happened out of it and I'm sort of amazed that I kept that consistency talk about consistency it's going to be two years now soon for the focus b show in September two years Uh, so (laughs) I was actually thinking about this yesterday because one of my mentors she says you have to have one thing where you don't drop the ball, where you Ooh, keep that consistency. I like and I was that. like, okay, LinkedIn posts, there's been some weeks where I've dropped it. Uh, Instagram, there's been some weeks. YouTube also. Uh, my newsletter, I've skipped, you know, the odd week, et cetera. And so I started to think, and I was like, God, the podcast is the only thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the only thing I haven't dropped the ball where I've published anything from one episode to seven episodes in a week. And um, yeah, haven't dropped the ball. So yeah, that kind of, that was an interesting insight for me. I like that. Sort of Don't drop the I like ball. Most. Wow. I like that. Don't drop the ball. Because you mentioned all those things and I've dropped the ball on all this. <laughs> yeah, me and, too. Except yeah, the podcast. And I, and I think exercising is, it's, uh, it's, it's so much of an ingrained habit that I shouldn't even, I'm not going to even count that because it's just so ingrained. But I like that from a creator standpoint or you know, all those are business related as well that, you know, whether it's the newsletter, the YouTube, the LinkedIn, the podcast, you know, so I really like that. I'm going to take that. Yeah. Um, just gonna, one thing. And I, yeah. I love that because she does these weekly events. Mm-hmm. I did that also for like three, four weeks and I dropped the ball, but that was the only thing she hadn't dropped the ball on these weekly events. That was her thing. And I thought, oh, well I dropped the ball. But, uh, but then I thought, Oh, yeah, the podcast, because I actually didn't realize at first I thought I dropped the ball on everything. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, never mind. I'll have to find that one consistent thing that I never drop the ball on. And I thought, oh, the podcast. So now, yeah, I'm going to aim to maintain that. And I think it's good because as content creators and we're creating so much content all the time that I think it's also cool sometimes to say, you know, if a week goes by and for whatever reason, like at one point I had a sort of not a creative burnout, but, you know, for about a week or 10 days, I couldn't produce any content. I just couldn't. Uh, It sounded fake. I couldn't do it. It was blocked. But I had enough leeway on the podcast, so that worked out fine. And so I think in those moments, it's fine. Just take a week, 10 days. Like, no one's going to notice. But it's quite nice psychologically if you have that one thing where you're staying consistent. Yeah, I like that. I really do. And so I got to decide. I think it's going to be the podcast. Nice. Yeah, I think it's the podcast. Um, I could do the same with the well-being routines, right? Because in my case, that's meditation. Mm -hmm. And cold showers pretty much also every single day. But I've dropped the ball on exercise a few times and other things. But I do not like cold showers. You don't like cold showers? Mm. (gasps) Of cold showers. But that's okay. I tolerate I tolerate heat better than cold. You know, some people some people can do ice baths really well, but they can't do the sauna. Oh yeah. Yeah. So what about the what about alternating sauna and cold shower? I can do that a little bit. I do that a little bit at my gym. So I, I will go to the sauna and then I'll go take a quick cold shower and then go That's right good. back because they're pretty yeah. close to each other. So, yeah, but um, good. both are beneficial. So I still do it, even though I don't like it. And I think that's kind of a motto in life that you're not going to like everything you do, even though it's beneficial. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So as we look to the future, what are you, what are you excited about? What are some things you're excited about? 
Um, well, I'm collaborating with um, a guy called the Giovanni Dinsman, who's the author of Mindful Self-Discipline. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually going to be the main trainer for all the programs based on the book. So I reached out to him and I said, look, I love your book. I want to facilitate trainings around mindful self-discipline. And he was all for it. And so I'm really excited about this. You know, we're putting together all the content. Uh, we're reaching out, you know, to different companies. And so this is more like a corporate side of things with the workshops and the training. So I'm really excited about that. And then on a coaching perspective, I've also sort of created my academy around transformative entrepreneurship. And I'm also really excited about that. So those are the two projects that I'm most excited about with entrepreneurs, academy, all around self-leadership, all on those topics that I love. And then mindful self-discipline, that's also a topic I love. Highly recommend the book for those listening. Seriously, book mind-blowing and uh, training for that. Now I have a bunch of other things going on, but those are my two sort of biggest highlights. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so that kind of leads into the next question as, as we get ready to wrap this up is what are basically, what are one to three books that have been transformative to your life? <laughs> yeah. transformative. Well, I definitely say mindful self-discipline. That's an amazing book. I love mm -hmm. that book. And then, oh God, there's so many, but that's definitely one of my top one. The Big Leap. Uh, I really love that's that. Mainly you read it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a very so good. good book. Yeah, so good. Mainly around the this concept that we have that our there's a sort of plateau of our happiness and it actually can get higher. I, I, yeah, that book changed my life. Amazing. And then a third book, I'm trying to think, because um, there's so many. Maybe. I mean, I always go back to the seven habits of highly effective people, mm -hmm. but just because yeah the seven habits amazing mind-blowing one of the first personal development books i read uh keep going back to it so deep and then also uh the power of now by eckhart toll that i know mm -hmm. that's four but <laughs> uh because i read that again and again and again and sometimes i read it and i just sort of pause and i'm like oh this is so deep and so wise and i feel reading that book is a bit like a guided meditation mm -hmm. you know it just grounds you so it's it's sort of you can't stop reading that book because every time you read it you get grounded again so love that yeah. book. it's one of those it's one of those books where you read it and read it it's it's so nourishing it's like eating this big hearty meal that's just so flavor rich right and there's so many different things going on in that meal that you probably have to come back and make this meal again or go eat it again and that's kind of like what those types of books are right you read the sentence you read this page then you go back to it maybe a year later and you're like man this sentence i did i i missed this i i thought i read this book but why didn't i get this the first time and it's like reliving it over and over again because there's different experiences that you get from the book usually i think depending on where you are in life different things are going to resonate and stick out to you yes yes absolutely and uh one thing also about the power of now is I, I really often think about it and the concept. So for instance, I'll just briefly share this because I've, I've found it's sort of, yeah, transformational. Uh, how he talks about how we see the present moment, right? He says, sometimes we see it as an obstacle or means to an end or an enemy. And I really think about this daily, mm -hmm. literally daily. I think, oh, right now you're not really enjoying this bit or whatever it is. You know, it could mm -hmm. be anything from taking out the trash to for doing some paperwork and I'm like you're just using the present as a means to and then I'm like yeah I am and then I'm like can we come back and at least maybe not enjoy the present but be present like mm -hmm. you don't have to like be like this is amazing but you can be like okay I'm bringing out the bit and not sort of thinking of something else or getting annoyed and frustrated about it you know it's stupid right uh but sometimes we do that when we're using it means to an end and then when we're using the present moment as an obstacle or an enemy, it gets even worse, right? You're racing right. in the queue and this is when people, you know, when the when the plane is delayed, you think like it's the end of the world, people shout and scream, not everyone, but some. And that's when the present moment suddenly becomes an enemy, right? They were wanted to be home or a work project and then flights two hour delayed and then that whole two hour becomes an enemy. Well, that's a waste, right? Like yes. those are two hours of your life. You're never going to get back. So <clears throat> I'm not saying I'm thrilled <laughs> when my flight's delayed, but I take a, a quick, you know, sort of mental check and think, okay, how do I make the most of this? You know, what do I read, listen to, look around so that I don't have this feeling because, yeah. So I think about that specific thing every day, every day. And it's so clear, means to an end, obstacle, enemy. And I try and come back. So yeah, amazing mm -hmm. book. I'm going to have to 
when I, I'm going to re-listen to this and, and really sit on that. Cause that's a, <laughs> that's a pretty profound thing right there that um, I think a lot of us do. So I'll really have to really like digest that. Yeah. Yeah. For me. Yeah. And again, we all do it. The idea is not to judge ourselves or feel guilty or bad, whatever that's pointless, but more to be like, okay, how can I go from that? Mm-hmm. To just accepting the present moment that's the thing right you accept the you're waiting in a queue or the plane's delayed or you bring down the trash or whatever anything and the harder the situation like if you're sick or you you know going through you know something really tough or work or the more we're going to have that resistance right the more you want to skip forward or ignore it or distract yourself on your phone or watch a video and the more you manage to be present the more you'll be able to process that right mm-hmm. so if a client you know gives you some terrible feedback and you just instantly want to distract yourself and run everywhere, but you manage to stay present, you breathe in calmly, you take it on board, you answer back, then you'll probably have an okay evening. You'll process it. But if you start doing a million things and and reject it and go against it, then maybe two weeks later, you haven't processed it. So yeah, it's kind of (laughs) beneficial when we manage to accept the present moment, but it's just not always easy. Absolutely. And so the last question here is that pretend you have a cup, pretend you have a some tea or a bottle of wine, whatever your beverage of choice is. And you're at a dinner table, you're out in the nice countryside or your dream location. And you have three seats there and you can invite anyone dead or alive, excluding family to come sit down for a round table discussion with you. What three people would it be? <laughs> That's such a <laughs> question. <laughs> you really think, okay, let me pick three people. Uh, you know, imagine if I was introverted and I needed time to think, that would never work. Okay, well, I'd have to say Eckhart Toll because we've been talking about him. So that makes perfect sense. And, okay. Uh, love the guy. Then I'd probably say Tony Robbins just because I absolutely loved his energy on stage and he's achieved so much in the coaching field. Um, both these guys are alive so hey that's pretty good it's funny because I get very inspired by Tony Robbins and Eckhart Tolle alternatively and they have such different approaches right they do the spiritual route and the personal development route Uh, I'm more getting more and more sort of in the Eckhart Tolle way but you know I worked with the Tony Robbins coach Mm -hmm. for a year I loved his energy so that'd be amazing so I wonder how they'd get on (laughs) I'm getting all excited imagining conversation between Tony Robbins and Eckhart Tolle. I'm sure they get on really well, actually. Uh, and then who would the third one be? I feel it would have to be a woman because otherwise it sounds weird. And I mean, I love Mel Robbins. She's super cool. I love Oprah Winfrey. She's really interesting. Um, who would it be? Who would be a woman that I'd really like to meet? Dead or alive? So she could be dead. Uh, oh, so many people. Uh I'm trying to think because see, I'm thinking like Mel Robbins is super cool, but then I feel I've seen so much of her content. I feel I know her, but that's the same with Tony <laughs> Robbins. You know, like you just see her yeah. on LinkedIn every day. You're like, oh, okay, yeah, sort of you could see what you like. Um, I'm trying to think of a writer, maybe. Uh, she's written books. Who would be a great woman to me? Go on, give me five and I'll choose one. Uh, let's see. See, it's not that easy. Well, I, I think it just depends. Um, I think the reason why I ask this question as you're thinking about this is because usually the three, the people that we pick is usually an indication of who we are and the things that, we're, that we really gravitate toward. Interesting. You know, so those two are, are really big into personal, de- personal development. I would both say that they're also, there's a deep spiritual component with them as well. Tony Robbins just expresses his differently, but he's very much a Agreed. spiritual guy. Agreed. It's just probably more of a, it's more of a, you mentioned Eckhart Tolle, Moby, that's an introvert. Maybe he's more of an introvert. And that's who you used to, as you used to be, as you mentioned. Tony mm. uh, Robbins is more of an extrovert, mm. really out there. And you're a lot more comfortable being extroverted now. You facilitate a lot of trainings now. So that still shows you, you know, this is an indication of who you are without me yeah, having to true. ask who you true. are. So, no, I'm by, yeah, and by the way, I'm, I'm not introverted and I never was, but it was more if I were introverted, uh-huh. that would be a okay. really hard question because you have to think about mm-hmm. it a lot. But it's true, it, it can maybe illustrate the, the polarity. I'm trying to think also that it would be, um, it would be interesting to me, like a singer, like Ella Fitzgerald or something like that. Maybe that'd be good. Okay, She's, Ella Fitzgerald, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Oh, and I'd also like to meet Tolstoy. Can I add him to? There we go. That's interesting. That's we, really we, interesting. You know we what? We have we have an extra we have an extra seat in the back, and so we'll, we'll just bring it out. Just make sure we <laughs> we'll had enough refreshments. Yeah. 
<laughs> no, but that's also really interesting because Eckhart Tolle and Tony Robbins, first one came to my, oh, first one, spirituality, second, personal development, and yes, linked to spirituality. Third one was music, which I really love, and I do do singing and guitar. And third and fourth one was literature, and I love literature. So it does, you know, that's a good question. I'm going to ask that. It really does show sort of what the person is really interested in, because I think in my case, it's spirituality, personal development. It's not a surprise came first. And before that, my whole life, uh, when I quit my job as an engineer, before I discovered personal development, I wanted to be a singer or a writer. Those were the two things mm -hmm. I was most passionate about. And now they're sort of coming afterwards, <laughs> right? <laughs> now it's like personal development. I'm like, oh yeah, singing, writing. But that's interesting, no? Yeah. And so- and what, are you, what are your top three? It, see, it changes. It changes. Yeah. A lot of times yeah. it changes too, depending on who you are. So, you know, for me, I've just been, one would be- right now probably jfk mm. um frank sinatra and miles davis sinatra? yeah <laughs> and who and miles davis <clears throat> miles davis nice yeah. music nice. yeah so I, I like i like music but then also if you think about it um jfk was pr probably one of the most inspirational um presidents and aspirational yeah. as well you know and i think he was a pretty good unifier as well and Miles Davis was always constantly reinventing himself. If you listen to his jazz albums, they are so, um, he's always ahead of the trend. And then people get on. And then once he conquers something, he's always looking for ways to um, change it up. Just like I mentioned at the beginning, before we started recording, that sure. you, know, you get bored easily. You always want to keep innovating and try new things. And I think about health and that's kind of how I look at that. And Frank Sinatra is just, I mean, he's Frank Sinatra. I mean, uh, but he has good stage presence, right? He, he put he, very classy um, and he had gravitas as well. You know, he just commanded this 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 aura about him. And so uh, I just like those guys. And, um, and they, they're all pretty well-dressed guys as well. So it's, it's a lot of things, but you know, that, that answer changes a lot, but a lot of it depends on, what stage of life you're in and what's on your mind currently yeah i'm 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 wondering when when the echo toll and tony robbins would change but i might find other people in personal development i some love even more some people are a mainstay like miles davis is a mainstay yeah, yeah. miles davis is a mainstay yeah I also think I'd always want to meet Tolstoy. I find that hard to imagine it would change. Anyway, we'll see. We'll see. I'll do the same exercise in five years and see if it changes. That's why I wish I, I wish time traveling was possible. That's, that's just what I want. You know, um, I think the superhero, what is it? The Flash. Yeah, he can he can run really fast and go back. And I just I, I don't want to touch anything. I just want to like witness things or just like be able to, to you know, have a sit down. You know, yeah, agreed. Like, agreed. It's like, hey, I just, you know, I'm, I'm having coffee with Picasso right now or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, what are you doing on this Sunday, rainy Sunday afternoon? Hey, I'm hanging out with Picasso. Well, he's he's yeah, very prolific. Good. He's very prolific, right? He has like yeah, Picasso is amazing. Yeah, yeah Van Gogh had, also. Yeah, they just have like a whole museum with just their stuff. I'm just like, man, like, how does your brain work to just constantly create, 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 and it's not trash? That's the thing. <laughs> So, you know, you know, some people can, there's, there's some people that just create, 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 and it, it, it gets redundant or it's just not that good. True. But it's then true. there's some people who can just create, 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 and it's really good still. So, and just like, yeah, I know. you know, a lot of the jazz artists, they, they produced a lot of work and a lot of them died relatively sooner or their careers were cut short for various different reasons. And they have a expansive body of work. In, in just a, such a short window so um i could probably talk about this for two hours yeah i was yeah. just thinking about that uh <laughs> not going too much on tangent but i was thinking about salinger and the catcher in the rye and stuff that's the opposite he has a really small body of work but he produced very fast and like catcher in the rye i think he wrote in a month or a week whatever but then there's like a huge body of work of people who wrote about his work so i think that's really interesting some people who've written not that much or produced not that much but it has been so sort of mind-boggling that a gazillion people have written about it that's also like yeah. how deep was the work that they produced right i think i know that's the secret it. i think i know the secret go they on had, they had focus <laughs> they had focus yeah. that we didn't <laughs> and, talk about so yeah. we had no focus <laughs> and that's how we can circle back around and wrap this up in a nice bow is that they had focus and they had excellent attention management they did not exactly. have twitter there's no instagram they might have had a little cigarette 
They might have had a little alcohol. But other than that, they had excellent attention. They were not distracted. Exactly. That's, all these that's the things. secret. <laughs> <laughs> that is the secret. So, Katie, this has been an awesome conversation. Um, where can listeners keep up more with you? Yeah, well, uh, thanks for asking. Uh, they can uh, go to the Focus B show, first of all, and they can find the interview that we did where I interviewed you. Uh, on you know Spotify, Apple, YouTube, and otherwise connect with me on LinkedIn or Twitter or Instagram, either as the Focus B or under Katie Stoddart. So okay. I'm pretty easy to find. And I will have all this in the show notes in case you are listening right now and you are running, riding a bike or driving, riding a motorcycle. There's a couple other options, but I'll leave it there. And so, <laughs> <laughs> and so until couple next other time, options. exactly. So until next time, everyone stay awesome, be limitless and always never stop upgrading. Peace.